of Rays of the One Light. Chapter 53, The Last Commandment. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your de deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Jesus Christ, <clears throat> near the end of the Gospel, according to St. John, gave, us, gave as his last commandment that we love one another. In John 13, 34, and 35, he said, A new commandment I give unto you, that we love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall men know that ye are my disciples. Again, in John 15, 12, he said, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. How did he love us? Personally, yes, in the sense that he loved and forever loves each one of us for who we are, and not abstractly. But impersonally also, in the sense that the Christ, the divine consciousness, is not conscious of itself as separate from us. He loves us not only for, but as our very self. His love is a manifestation of infinity, loving us as ex expressions of infinity. He does not see us as we see ourselves. He forever sees in us our divine potential. Paramahansa Yogananda made a very similar statement to the monks very shortly before his departure from his body. Respect one another as I respect you. His use of the word respect instead of love was deliberate. He wanted to emphasize for them the importance of impersonal love and friendship from God for God. Worldly people do not understand that in impersonal love there is much deeper love than exists in personal love. Impersonal love is expansive, not contractive. One day, the master was going for an outing, and the monks were helping him into his car. Yogananda had been having difficulty with his knees. He remarked, you are all so kind to me with all your many attentions. Oh, sir, they replied, it is your kindness to which we respond. The master smiled sweetly. God is helping God, he said. That is his drama. The second commandment Jesus quoted from the ancient scriptures, love thy neighbor as thyself, explains what he meant by his new and last commandment. We should, he said, love, <coughs> love all as reflections of our very self. <coughs> Thus, Paramahansa Yogananda said also, when I am gone, only love can take my place. <clears throat> the Bhagavad Gita describes a dialogue between Krishna and his disciple Arjuna. Thus, the other disciples are not part of the scene. The dialogue is internal and symbolizes the dialogue between the soul and God. Yet in it, Sri Krishna describes the way to pursue supreme wisdom and supreme love the serene self, being one with Brahman, neither grieves nor yearns. The same to all, he attains supreme devotion to me. That sameness toward all is the manifestation of pure love, impersonal in the sense of selfless. By that love, one attains supreme love for God alone. Thus, through the Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind.
Welcome everyone. My name is Naya Swami Dharmini and I hope you're doing well. This is Naya Swami Ramani and my husband Dharmaraj is in seclusion, which is a wonderful thing we all try and do once a year. A week of seclusion meaning absolutely no contact with anyone else, trying to keep all the electronics off, uh, just having um, time. Uh, sometimes uh, you can just chant and pray and meditate and eat healthily and uh, go out in nature and breathe fresh air. It's a wonderful thing to do. And I know some people go, oh my God, a whole week, no way. <laughs> but even one day is good, even one day. And think about that, uh, especially during this holiday time and the new year and trying to set a new intention for what this coming year is going to be. Think about, if you can't take a whole day, take a half day. And any time with the thought that this is seclusion with only me and God is helpful. For anybody. Today's reading, um, is really about human love versus divine love, and I'm going to read this reading uh, from Yogananda's Whispers from Eternity. It's entitled, Demand to See God's Love in All Human Love. With the love of all human loves, I have come to love thee. Thou God of all loves, Thou art the Father, anxious to protect His children. Thou art the little child, lisping love to its parents. Thou art the mother, showering infinite kindnesses on all her family. Thou dost flow in the all-surrendering love of the lover for the beloved. Thou art the love of friends for one another. Purify me with the reverence of a servant to his master. Teach me to love thee with all pure loves, for thou art the fountain of love, both earthly and heavenly. Bathe me in the fountain spray of all loves. The theory of loving everyone is very, uh, seems very easy. Uh, it's easy to proclaim, I love everybody, you know, I, I love you, I love everybody, and my whole philosophy of love is love, you know, my whole life is love. And, and then it's like, until you don't give me what I want. And then, even though we're still proclaiming this philosophy of love, as soon as we don't get what we want, suddenly it turns to anger, disappointment, um, you're not giving me what I want. And, and Master and Swamiji talk a lot about impersonal love. And when we're teaching classes, people will often think, well, I don't want to love impersonally. That means I'm standoffish, or it means I'm kind of withdrawn, or kind of stiff in my love, or you know, I'm not really relating to somebody well. But in, that's not impersonal love. Impersonal love is when we are truly allowing love to flow through us. And when we allow love to flow through us, that's God love, God's love. That's not love from our own small human selves. That's God's love flowing through. When we allow that to flow through without desiring anything in return, that's divine, that is impersonal love. Very simple. And it feels different. When you're around people who love impersonally, it feels different. The, sometimes there's this feeling of intimacy you get when you're one-on-one -on -one with someone, and it's like, I love you, and you love me, and you're looking into each other's eyes and affirming that, you know, I'm your mother and you're my daddy, and we just love each other. And that love, I remember when I was in college, I had that with my boyfriend in college, and we just really met each other's needs that way. And yet, we didn't have a foundation of God's love to really um, have that be unconditional. Let's put it that way. It couldn't be unconditional. As long as it was me loving him so deeply and him loving me so deeply, it 
we were giving and getting from each other. And that giving and getting had no reaching upward to pull us up. There was nothing coming from above flowing through. It was just me, my little love, and his, his little love. And it led to power struggles. Because then you lead, then you start saying, well, I'm going to withdraw my love in that case because you didn't do what I wanted. And so it's like, well, if you're going to withdraw <coughs> your love, then I'm going to withdraw my love. And then you'll see how painful it is when you're not getting my love. And then you'll see how painful it is when I'm not getting, you know, I mean, I mean it's just, and that's the power struggle that we get in. You're not doing what I want. I'm not doing what you're want, you want. And as long as it's on that level, it's so painful, isn't it? Because we're all seeking, what we're truly seeking is we're seeking divine love. And Yogananda even says, we need to find that divine love through another. That, that yes, we are definitely seeking it from God. We're having that connection, that flow of love with God. But we also have to seek it in another. We also have to find it in another. And that's the, the thought of the true soulmate. That there really is a twin soul somewhere, whether in the body or not. That is our soulmate. Master said that he and Rajasi were soulmates. You see them walking around together. And, and th that soulmate union has to happen for you both to be free. Now again, it may not be in the body. You may connect with your soulmate in the astral and still be able to be free. Now that's getting back into theory. <laughs> in terms of love, and truly practicing that love. You know, there's good days when we're feeling so open and so wide open and it's so easy to love. And I don't mean from the small self. I remember I remember really feeling that love flowing through. I don't mean I remember, but um, what I mean is that love really flowing through and that connection that you have with people can feel um, very fulfilling, and yet you, you're conscious that that love really is coming from God. And then there's the bad days. The days we wake up feeling kind of crickety and crotchety, and somehow there's a mood, and we walk into a room and everyone kind of goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see someone when they're in that mode. And often what we do when we see someone in that mode is kind of, huh, going to send distance. But what's really helpful is to at least silently send love to that person. They're probably hurting on some level. Imagine if we're that person, we are. We know we're hurting on that level when we're feeling so closed and cranky. And how supportive it feels when those around us send love to us anyway despite being cranky. Not that we deserve it when, <laughs> when we're being that cranky. We deserve it from God 100%. But the humans around us, they're not obligated to send us that, but it's really nice when they do. Um, you know, for, for many, many years, uh, ever since I was 16, I was in relationships. And it was just, you know, one boyfriend after, after the other. And finally, you know, I had a big long one in college and then more after college and all that type of thing. And then I came to Ananda. And the boyfriend I had right before Ananda was um, also very spiritual and also drawn to Ananda. But the more I spent time with Ananda, he told me he was jealous of Ananda. And I, I remember feeling such a pull to master that I knew small human love with jealousy shouldn't get in the way of my wanting to experience this bigger love and master. And, I, and we had to break up. It was too bad. Actually, we were very good friends now, and he's on the path. <laughs> but I had to let go. I had to choose. In my mind, I was choosing divine love versus 
small human love in that case. And then, uh, one of the things we often say when moving into an Ananda community, meaning suppose we had an actual community where people can move in besides just the ashram, other new people too, it's often recommended that people be celibate for a year when they first move in. And to really go deep and dive into their spiritual practices, dive into Kriya Yoga, really develop a strong connection with Master and with their spiritual practices before then trying to try yet another relationship. And I felt very blessed because I entered an astrological cycle called K2. Um, for those of you who know Vedic astrology, it's a very spiritual uh, um, astrological cycle that will tend to make you cut off worldly ties, but also really dive deep into a more monastic life. And for six years, I actually got to live as a nun. Uh, not formally, I didn't um, take vows or anything like that, but for some reason, you know, from 16 to 27, I decided I was having one relationship as after another, and then from 27 to whatever, 33, I just lived as a nun, and I was, it was a really wonderful time in my life. I didn't desire a relationship, but was lucky. I didn't have that constant desiring that, that can come. And then towards the end of that cycle, it started getting stirred up again. I started feeling that desire to have a relationship with someone else. But I was coming from six years of really um, feeling a strong connection for myself in God. And um, uh, I actually had a relationship that was very testing at the, uh, towards the end of the K2 cycle. I wasn't out of the K2 cycle. And sometimes relationships in the K2 cycle are destined for doom. So I had this relationship, very brief, but it was very deep. And again, it, I ended up with this huge heartbreak because it was not enough of the divine love versus whatever. Also, I think as souls we weren't meant to be together. But he had a very definite view of what human love should be, and it was not enough of the, the spiritual love. And so it was kind of a final test of that human love versus spiritual love. Not that they both don't coexist, but if you know what I mean, these uh, having the divine love be the dominant characteristic. And so there was a big breakup again, and again I was able to complete the cycle more as a nun in that case. And then one day Dharmaraj and I met, and I, I knew it was different. Um, uh, we had a normal relationship, you know, we, it wasn't like we were being a monk and nun together or anything like that. But that love that we were sharing was coming from a more divine place. And it was because both of us were committed to that. Both of us were committed to not trying to get love from the other person. Both of us were committed to the principles of sharing love in a divine way. And it, it was the grace of God to meet a partner like that. And um, for anybody who does meet that, I, I wish that for everybody in this room. And if not, if you haven't reached that yet, or if you're in between that, really dive deep, cleanse the aura. Really dive deep into what you have now, in terms of if you're alone, go deep into it. Really allow that to, um, not you're not alone, allow that love of God to be your divine lover in that way. Allow God to be your boyfriend or girlfriend and to give you all that you need in that relationship Again, it's not like something we can just say, okay, now I'm loving and now I'm feeling God's love. Do, 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 you know, how great, you know. I'm thinking that I'm loving and feeling God's love. I know, theoretically, God loves me, 
but I'm not feeling it. How can I feel it? How can I really practice that and have it really come into my life? And I just have to say meditate. You know, it, we can be in the, the deepest, darkest time and five minutes of meditation can just bring us out, out of ourselves, out of our um, unhappiness, out of our, and I don't mean this in a de judgmental way, but self-centeredness. And, um, and it's so nice to have these principles that we practice here that are masters, the, the Kriya Yoga, the Hong Sa that we have. To be able to just know Hong Sa, which is a very, very sacred technique. For those of you who don't know it, we are going to be starting up some more classes in January. Um, and it's on the website, which what classes that we're teaching. But to be able to have a technique, to not just sit. Before, before I found these techniques, I used to sit. I meditated. I felt very peaceful afterwards. But to actually have a technique given by our guru, that we can practice, and that is scientifically proven, meaning we sit in our chairs, we practice it, and we notice the benefits. When we teach a Learn to Meditate class, it's amazing how just after one practice session with people, they come back and they say, oh my gosh, my life feels changed. Why is that happening? Because we're really touching our soul. Every time we sit and meditate, we touch our soul and we feed ourselves with um, the, the soul love that's coming to us. And when we stop meditating, when we um, decide, oh, you know, I don't have to meditate today, I meditated yesterday, we're starving that connection. And the, the more we starve it, the more we feel as though something's really lacking, the more